All right, so I've got to explain about the crutches. Uh, I asked my kids to help me think of a better story, right? I was like, is it a triathlon injury? Is it, you know, bungee jumping? Something like that. But the God's honest truth is that uh, I tore a ligament on the way into mass this Sunday. Can you believe it? <laughs> so that's my super adventurous life. Uh, next week, I'll go to confession for sure on Saturday. I guess that was my fault. Anyway, uh, before we get to the nuts and bolts here, and I want to say thanks to Catherine, who is such a partner in all this good work and really such an example for all of us. Um, and before we get into the nuts and bolts here, I, we need to frame this discussion with some background for what's going on in public life these days and why Catholic women are so central to giving an effective response to it. So how do we explain the economic and social divides in our country, this chaotic political moment that we're facing, the hostility that we see in so many discussions that we have online or in our personal lives? How do we explain it? I don't think we're in a crisis of freedom, as some people say, or even in an economic crisis, as others might talk about. I think we're in a crisis of solidarity, as First Things editor Rusty Reno has said. He said, along with many others, he says, that the greatest threat we face is an untethered individualism, an atomized society. And at its root, this stems from a loss of those mediating institutions that women are often so central to, right? The family, church, community and neighborhood associations. And most importantly, a loss of a faith in the sense that we're all in this together, right? And that's what solidarity is all about. And that's why Pope Francis is such a gift to the church at this time, precisely this time, because he knows this deeply. He's made solidarity the center of his pontificate, solidarity with others, solidarity especially with the voiceless and vulnerable, with the poor, with those who aren't right there in front of us. And not only has he correctly diagnosed the problem, but he's shown us again and again how to respond with mercy, with immediacy, with presence, with particular care for the poor and the vulnerable. These are all what we call the marks of real solidarity. And through it all, he speaks the truth with love, as my friend Catherine says all the time so well. And in fact, his whole pontificate from Lampedusa, if you remember very early on when he went, there was a huge disaster. A, a migrant ship had, had capsized and hundreds died. And he went right away. It's one of my favorite stories, actually. Very interesting. He, uh, he um, wanted to go to Lampedusa right after his pontificate had started because of this awful, tragic shipwreck. And so he said to his advisors, uh, you know, I need to go to Lampedusa. We need to, to, to say something about this tragedy. And they said, yes, Holy Father, we can fit it on your schedule in, you know, maybe six months or so. You know, we're very booked up. And he's like, no, 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 I want to go next week. And they said, mm, we can't make that happen. Uh, and he said, okay. And he went back. And the next day... One of his senior advisors got a phone call from Alitalia, the Italian airline, uh, saying, you know, we've got to tell you, someone who's pretending to be Pope Francis is calling and trying to get a flight to Lampedusa. Uh, so they knew who was driving the train then, right? And they made it work, and they made it happen. But from that event um, to Evangelii Gaudium, to Laudato Si, to his international travels, to his trip here to the U.S., to Amoris Laetitia, through all of those events, what he's been doing is trying to build a sense of solidarity, a sense that we're all in this together. And here's what he said last Christmas Eve as an example. Amid a culture of indifference, which not infrequently turns ruthless, our style of life should instead be devout, filled with empathy and compassion and mercy, drawn daily from the wellspring of prayer. So now why do I say this to you when we're here talking about the feminine genius? because it's directly relevant to our questions today. How do we move forward on these challenges and build a culture of solidarity, both close to home and in our culture at large? How do we put all of this into effect precisely as women? Here's one thing that we can say at the start, without any hesitation, women must be at the center of any response to this crisis of solidarity. Because after all, what is the feminine genius? It's nothing if it's not a gift for solidarity, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. So with that background, let me tell you the three main questions I'm going to be talking about. What it means to be feminine in the church. What is this feminine genius we keep talking about? The difference women can and do make in the church today, right now. And finally, the current need for an increased presence of women in the church. So first, what do we mean when we talk about the feminine genius? I'm sure you're hearing a lot about this already, and you're going to hear more about it all week. 
I'd say at its simplest, it's a capacity for self-giving, for solidarity with others, and a heightened awareness of the relationality of our lives that flows from that. As Pope Francis has emphasized again and again, we're all interconnected. The center of our faith is to get relationships right, whether it's our relationship with God or our relationship with others, to build what he and many others have called an integral ecology. And this interconnectedness, this relationality, is central to our understanding of God. And here's another great way to talk about it. He said that not only man is such, and not only woman is such, but rather man and woman, as a couple, are the image of God. The difference between them is not a question of contrast, not a question of subordination, but instead of communion and generation, always in the image and semblance of God. And women are the key here, both at a personal and at a social level. We have a particular openness to being merciful. Here's a great definition of mercy by Father James Keenan, the willingness to enter into the chaos of another. And now which one of you, when faced with a friend, facing a difficulty, a difficult problem, would say, oh, I can't do that, I can't go there, right? We don't do that, right? That's what we're called to do, is enter into those troubles. Um, we often have that gift for accompaniment. It's a call to be courageous and countercultural. And so many of the young women I meet in my work, and I'm sure so many of you here today, are searching for that countercultural, courageous, depoliticized, radical Christianity. And it's a Christianity we see among so many of the women religious here today who have gone against what our culture says and called to live a life that is radically Christian. But of course, you don't have to be a religious to do that. You can do that in your everyday life, whatever your particular vocation is. One place I've learned a lot about what the feminine genius means over the last few years is a group called the Catholic Women's Forum, which is here in DC. And it collects women from think tanks, from the academy, um, journalists like Catherine and many others. Uh, and we talk about what the feminist genius, mean, genius means and how we can put that into practice. Uh, and one of the women there, Susan Selner Wright, gave what I think was a great definition. If the feminist genius means anything, she said, it means the capacity of women to see the both and where men see the either or, a resistance to the tendency to fix things rather than to accompany people while enduring them. So that's what we talk about. And what are the implications for this idea of feminine genius? Our creative task is to bring our particular gifts to create the circumstances where real community can be formed. Intuitively know what it means to live mercifully, to bring mercy to others. It should be part of everything we do and how we act. So how do we understand what mercy means? I think one of the first ways, that great video of the moms up there, right? I mean, one of the ways we know what mercy means is by looking to how mothers act. Um, my mom, a great example from my life, is my, I was a teacher for a year after I graduated from college. And I thought, uh, you know, being young and, and coming from a lot of schooling, I thought I was just gonna walk into this and knock it out of the park. And I'll remember when my mom, when I was leaving to go do this, my mom said to me, just remember that everyone in there is someone's child. Everyone in there is the most important person in the world to someone, to their mother. And I got to tell you, it changed my view of all those kids in my class who gave me such a hard time. And, and I had, you know, really had to grow and learn how to teach. But through that, remembering that, they were all people who had mothers who loved them so much. Uh, that's how I knew how to act mercifully in that situation. Uh, I see it in my class and with my kids these days. We have a first grade teacher who's taught every one of our six children how to read. She's wonderful. And I'll tell you, with our, when our oldest went in there, I'd go into my conferences and I'd say, uh, you know, what can we do? And I'd be all nervous. It's my first time in here. And she would make me feel like our oldest child was the most special, the most gifted, you know, everything. What a wonderful kid this was. And, you know, we had issues, challenges, et cetera, et cetera. But what a gift this per my child, my daughter was to the world. And then my second child, also the most gifted, the most special kid. And my third, and by about the fourth, I realized that every child in her classroom was gifted and special, and she treated them all with mercy, and she showed me how to do that as a mom. But let's also talk professionally uh, about how, we, how women use and live mercy in their lives professionally. Uh, you've heard Helen here today, who's a good friend of mine and a colleague, and her tireless service to the church over years and years is such a witness to all of us about what it means to live the feminine genius. And I can tell you that not only in her professional life, but Personally, she's constantly having people over to her house for dinner. Constantly, all of a sudden, there'll be a student from Australia who's living with them for six months because they wanted to study Catholicism at CUA or what have you. Um, we talk about, uh, we talk about Kat Carolyn Wu, who you're hearing as well. She may be the most effective 
outstanding organizational leader I've met in my work in the church, bar none. And I say that because essential to her leadership is her understanding and respect for the people who work for her. And I've seen that time and time again in my work for her, and you should really take her as a model of what you might do here in the church as women. Um, so secondly, let's talk about what women can, and can do in the church uh, to be leaders, to bring that feminine genius to bear. Well, first of all, I would say that you don't need a Roman collar to make a difference in the church. This isn't about ordination. We have a long history of women's leadership here in the church. The church has a long history of affirming women's dignity and flourishing and giving women real positions of strength. Um, but we also see that women have a remarkable history today. And first of all, we should point to the Sisters of Life on their 25th anniversary. What a I mean, everybody, let's give them a round of applause. And I'll... And all the many sisters here today, right? I mean, what a remarkable witness they have done in building up this great service to women who are facing unplanned pregnancies. Uh, other women religious too, of course. Recently, a group called Fatica did a study of women religious here in the United States. And what they found was this was a very hopeful time for young women trying, thinking about a particular vocation to become a religious woman. 8% of never married Catholic women have considered such a vocation. I think that's a remarkably high number and nothing like the kind of uh, negativity that you often hear about this. 1,200 women are in formation around the country right now and they're bringing a new energy and optimism to this. And 72% of millennial Catholic women note the importance of community life in drawing them to consider a vocation. So I would say, once again, we hear about that solidarity and what women bring to, to the church and bring this sense of community and seeking community. Uh, secondly, women lead many of our great social service ministries. One of the unique aspects of the church today is that here in the United States, we have Carolyn Wu leading Catholic Relief Services. We have Sister Carol Kia leading the Catholic Health Association. We have Sister Carol, uh, excuse me, Sister Donna Markham leading Catholic Charities. So our three great social service ministries here in the United States are led by women. Uh, the fourth, the National Catholic Education Association, is usually led by a woman, but right now happens to be led by a man in the interim. But in any event, we had a great event last year here in D.C. where we brought all these great women together. We had high school students there to see this witness of these are women who are leading organizations that put the church in that field hospital Pope Francis keeps talking about. We see lay leaders like Helen and others in think tanks, in the academy, Catherine and prestigious award-winning journalist, Anna and Anna here as well. Um, and others who work in, in think tanks and in public service. And we see groups like the Women Speak for Themselves, which you heard about a little bit earlier. Helen and I started a few years ago in the wake of the HHS mandate, or Catholic Voices. In my own work at the Bishops' Conference, we saw many women who were in leadership roles that I never would have known about otherwise. Um, and in many dioceses around the country, you see women who are leading the charge in those dioceses in leadership positions. Finally, I just have to mention that it's in your parishes. When you leave here, I hope that so many of you go and, and consider a career in the church uh, because there are so many opportunities right now. But I will say that it's in your parishes when you go home that you can be real leaders because we all know that it's in parishes that women are the backbone of our church. We're called to build a Catholic culture in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and it's women who do that. In my parish, I have a great parish here in D.C. Uh, my husband was on the parish council for a while, and one of the great stories is we have a sodality, which I used to think about as being you know, women who took care of the altar and such generally older women. In our parish, there are a couple hundred women of all different ages, uh, and they do everything And in the church, it seems like. He was on the parish council at one point and would come home from meetings, and he'd say, well, here it happened again, you know, the... Social Justice Committee said they were going to have another committee meeting to talk about such and such. And the plant, you know, the physical plant committee were going to have another meeting to talk about such and such. And then the Sodality came in and they had raised $10,000 for a homeless shelter and they had been making sandwiches and they had, you know, you know, for a group downtown and they had, you know, given Christmas gifts to 20 families, et cetera, et cetera, and just listed the many ways in which these women in our parish were serving our community right there. And I think that's what we're all called to do, especially, is whatever we do professionally in our daily lives, to be sure that we build up Catholic culture and community where we are in our neighborhood, in our family, in our parish, build that renewed and rooted Catholic culture. Now third, the current need for robust Catholic presence in the church. Having said all of that, I don't want to be a Pollyanna about this. There's much room for improvement when it comes to increasing women's presence in the church and their roles. Pope Francis has acknowledged the need to give women a greater room for a more capillary and incisive female presence in the church. 
to develop what he calls a theology of womanhood and also increase the presence of women where important decisions are made, both in the church and in social structures. So where are we now on all of this? Well, first of all, we know that women are leading theologians, and that's only increasing. Um, Pope Francis has appointed five women to the International Theological Commission. Women hold leadership positions on pontifical councils and other Vatican bodies, and then on Vatican boards and commissions and advisory groups as well. These are great successes, and we should continue to seek this kind of role for sure. And at the same time, we should resist clericalism. We should recognize that we can serve wherever we are in whatever role we can, whether we be as lawyers, as journalists, as doctors. We can bring our feminine genius and our deep faith to those roles as well. Um, but if the feminine genius is real, right, if this is a real thing that we should all value, it follows that women should have a robust place in the church within church governance and decision making. We should bring our particular decision making, dis particular distinctiveness, our lived understanding of mercy and relationality that I've talked about, of solidarity, to the church. And we should be a practical, effective voice within it. And so I really encourage you all to do what you can. If you're interested in, uh, if you're interested in the law, um, see if you can bring that talent. Think about whether you're called to bring that talent to church work. Think about whether you're called to bring your talents for writing to church work. Think about if you're interested in international work or diplomacy, wow, have I got a place to live for you in Rome. I mean, I mean, is it any better to learn Italian and go live in Rome and work at the Vatican? I can't think of a better job. I really can't. I think those are the kinds of things you should all be considering. Um, and at the same time, as we've talked about, think about transfiguring your everyday life with this feminine genius, with this understanding of mercy and solidarity. It's such an exciting time in the church. Um, we have this crisis of solidarity in our society, but we also have Pope Francis pointing us in a direction how to resolve it, and specifically calling on women and our particular gifts of mercy and solidarity to build, step up at this time. Um, St. John Paul II said the church is a home and a family for everyone, especially those who are heavy laden. And that, I think, is a great way for us to think about what we're called to do, build a home wherever we are, for people, show them that our faith is welcoming. And Pope Francis has said, here's how we do it. Be grateful, be joyful, and be of use. I hope one of the ways that some of you choose to serve, choose to be of use, is within the church because it's a great time to do so and what an exciting opportunity. Thanks very much.